much. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, yes, AJ's um, asked me to give a brief introduction before he starts off today. Um, so I've been thinking about uh, how can I possibly do justice to what I think you're about to hear, because the first time I met AJ, um, it literally changed my life. Um, and so really the only thing I think I can do is perhaps tell you a bit about what's happened to me having met AJ and having practiced what he's been teaching, really. So um, by way of background, I've been sort of searching spiritually for probably about seven years, initially as a bit of a tourist, um, and then more seriously. And I got to the point where everything, every path I went down seemed to sort of end with, like, well, this doesn't quite fit, or there's something missing here, or, I, you know, it just didn't feel right. And then two years ago, I met AJ, and um, he gave us, he was giving a talk very similar to the one that you're about to hear now. And so I started off, and I was like, yeah, well, I know that. I've read that. I've heard this. And then, then it was kind of, hmm, I've never heard that before. And, uh, ah, wow, that's kind of different. And this makes a lot of sense. And, wow, I wonder if this is really true. And um, it literally blew me away that evening. And I went back with my girlfriend. And we literally, well, we stayed up to about 4 o'clock in the morning that night just discussing what we'd heard and um, going through it. And uh, so we sat there and we thought, okay, well, what should we do? Um, and AJ said, well, try it and see if it works. So uh, that's what we decided to do. We thought, okay, well, we'll try this. And let's see if it really does change our lives because it feels like it will do. And so um, the first thing we did was had a bit of a truth purge in our relationship. And um, I can say it was a pretty ex painful experience, to be honest with you. Um, heard some things I really didn't want to hear. Um, and um, yeah, that was the start, really. And uh, But in doing that, from hearing the truth, there's also a kind of relief that came with it. And some of the insecurities that I may have felt, or those feelings that I couldn't get rid of, at least I were validated now. and. Having had that truth, it allowed me to look at the situation and sort of think, okay, well, at least I know what, what we're honest now and we know where we're at. And we started moving forward from there and practicing as much as we could. Um, the next thing was have a truth session with myself about who I really am. And that was even harder. Um, when, when, you start, when, I, when I started looking at myself and sort of looking at who I thought I was and who I presented myself to be to the world, and I looked very carefully at what my actual actions were, I noticed there was a gap between the two. And that gap was, if you like, the emotions that were within me that I really didn't want to look at, the feelings I didn't want to feel, the, the insecurities I was trying to cover. And... Um, yeah, and that was a that was a very hard experience, and um, with a lot of AJ's help, and um, watching a lot of DVDs and listening, I managed to work my way through this process of being more and more honest with myself, and being more open-minded, uh, being more humble. Humility has been a huge part of this. Um, when I started off, I thought I knew quite a lot about the world and myself and spirituality, and the further I go down this path, I realize I know very little. Um, or at least I'm, I'm learning more, as more honest I can be with myself. So, um, yeah, it's been what I'd, a life-changing experience for me, um, both for myself, my partner, and I'm sure there's many of you here that know AJ um, that have also found this to be pretty life-changing as well. Um, some of the most amazing things that I've found is like when I can connect to an emotion and I start really owning and taking responsibility for myself rather than blaming somebody else or being angry with somebody else. I find my life starts to change and I see my children change as well. When I can deal with something, my children are freed from that emotion that I'm not dealing with and that responsibility to try and, and now I guess I used to shut them down and not want them to reflect back to me. So there's been, there's been so many things um, along this journey. Um, and really all I'd say to you before sort of wrapping up is that to get something from this as much as a part, if you can get just a tenth or a hundredth of what I've received from learning from AJ, it's like, please try and be as open-minded as possible. That's helped me so much because I found some of the hardest things and things that have slowed me down the most are when I've really tried to hold on to like an old belief or something that I just don't want to be true. 
And um, that's sort of, yeah, that's been a real hindrance, especially when I look back and think, ah, oh, yes, yeah, that was right, damn. Uh, that took a long time to fill that one. And um, so when I do get stuck, another thing that I try and do is like, I look back to where I was at a week ago or a month ago or even a year ago, and I see how much I've changed and how much my life has improved by following what AJ has taught and just always trying to look honestly at what's happening and always taking responsibility for myself and always trying to feel my emotions. Um, okay. That's where I'm at now, but um, I think that'll probably do for me, really. Um, and uh, I'll pass you over to AJ. Thanks, Michael. Everyone can hear me fine? Yeah. Well, I'd like to welcome all of you along today. Um, some of you, or many of you, have already heard some of these uh, truths that we'll be discussing today. Some of you have been invited to come by those who have already heard. So don't you go blaming them for anything that I say. <laughs> anything I say is my responsibility, not theirs. Um, what I would like to do firstly, though, is just give you a little brief overview of, of my life, perhaps. Uh, it'll be very brief. In fact, it, I think I'll just make it one line. Um, Alan John Miller, that's why people call me AJ, because of Alan John, you know, the first two le letters of those names. I'm 46 years old, and uh, I live just uh, northwest of Kingaroy in Queensland. And uh, that's about all you really need to know about me, really, isn't it? Don't you think? You'll, you'll find out more as we go along, I'm sure. <laughs> what we're going to do today is present to you, I want to present to you an overview of the universe. Now, many of the things I present today are going to be quite challenging. Because many of you have done years and years of spiritual uh, investigation. Some of you have done years of uh, material investigation in terms of the, sci the science of the universe. Some of you have done more spiritual investigations. You may have been in many different forms of religion through the time of your life. You may uh, be involved in the New Age type movement in terms of discovering things about spirits, for example. Or you may just have a, a very natural scientific bent and you've been using all of that knowledge to actually discover things about the world in which we live in and what's going on inside of yourself. And what I would like to do today is start presenting to you some things that I call the divine truths of the universe. And it's, I'm not saying that you have to accept that they are the divine truths of the universe. What I'm saying is I'm going to present them to you and you have your free will choice to make a decision as to whether you want to investigate these things further or not. My suggestion to you is to investigate them further, of course, but I don't expect you to investigate them, and I don't want you to investigate them. It's up to you what you do with the knowledge that you receive today. That's why I don't charge for any seminars that I do. We just have a donation box at the back to cover Mary and I, our expenses and our living expenses. And if you don't, if you walk out the door today not donating at all, I don't want you to feel bad about that at all because that is your um, feelings that, that are being expressed. So what I would like you to do is just express your feelings all the time during these sessions. Now, some of the problem with, with that is, with me asking you for that to do that, is that some of your feelings are going to be what I would call a group of dissatisfied feelings. So let's have a look at uh, what kind of things. Let's say, let's say if you can imagine for a moment that inside of you is this like this container of emotions. So let's draw it as a big circle, a container of emotions. And inside of your feeling, inside, is, inside this container are all sorts of emotions. But basically, you could divide them up into two different types. You could say you've got the emotions where you feel satisfied, satisfied. You'll notice I'm not a very good speller, so that's, that's one of the first things you'll notice about me. The next set of emotions are the emotions that you feel when you are dissatisfied. Now, most of us love experiencing the satisfied emotions. Do you find you have any trouble with those? 
Like joy, you, you know, you have a real stressful time when you feel joy. Is that how you feel? No, no okay. And what about, you know, when you're making love to your wife or, or your husband, you, know, you have a real stressful time with that, like that's a terrible time, or is that more of a joyful, satisfaction type emotion? Well, for many, that would be a satisfied emotion, particularly afterwards, which shall we say. And um, what about uh, the emotions of, uh, of excitement? You know, when you go down to one of these theme parks, and I know many of you are probably bored with them now, but I haven't been to many of them, so when you go there, there's just that excitement all day, pretty much, a lovely emotion. Have no trouble generally feeling those emotions. Um, if you put me in the surf, and there's good surf, I'm happy all day, so that's a very satisfied emotion. How do you, I, I don't know how you feel about the surf, but that's my feeling, really satisfied emotion there. The issue with satisfied emotions is that we have no trouble experiencing them. The issue with these groups of emotions is we have a lot of trouble generally experiencing them in an appropriate manner. And when I say appropriate, I mean in a manner that doesn't dump something on somebody else that's negative. So what kind of dissatisfied emotions may we have? Well, anger is perhaps one of them. Now, not many of us enjoy anger, although you, sometimes you wonder, don't you, when, with some, that they must enjoy it, but not many of us really enjoy the feeling of it. It feels very, there's a lot of agitation in us emotionally when we feel anger. But what about the emotion of, like, resentment? Which is sort of like almost an extension of anger. Most of us feel quite the same there, too. Very hard to feel. What about... And this is something that's going to come up a lot today, trust me. Doubt. Doubt's a funny sort of emotion, isn't it? Like, because it, it, it causes you to oscillate between, oh, this is interesting, and oh, no, there's something wrong here, and then, oh, this is interesting, and then, oh, no, there's something wrong here. And in between those oscillations, if we could call them emotionally, there's this feeling inside, oh, I just want the whole thing. Now, to be frank with you, many of you have probably felt that your entire life on the spiritual journeys, haven't you? How many of you have felt that, this, this feeling of you go, as, as Michael described earlier, you, you go into you know, a certain spiritual path, initially you're feeling really, really enthused, you think there's a lot of truth in it, you can feel that truth resonate with you and so you believe it, and then as you go on, something comes up and you think, ah, oh, something's wrong here. Something's wrong, and then it gets so bad that there's so many things wrong that you decide, no, I can't go any longer on that particular path. And then through your law of attraction, another path comes to you, and you go through the same cycle. Yes, very enthusiastic. Yes, that feels really good. And off we go again on the same, and then eventually we get to the end. And if you look at our life from a point of view of investigating truth, often our life is like this great big oscillation, if you like, where we think we're harmonious with truth, we think we're on the right path and then we see doubts come in and then we go down and then we get a bit annoyed with the whole process and we ask ourselves, whoever created this flippin' universe, why didn't he just come and download the truth to me, you know, like, and get all this pain all over and done with, right? And so we go through this doubt. Now today you're going to have many doubts, trust me. And it's not my responsibility to clear up your doubts for you, by the way. But... Understand that doubt is different than the emotion, which is a more satisfied emotion, of discernment. What do I mean by discernment? What I mean is the ability to not yet make a decision, even though you're hearing confronting things. So what you do when you're discerning is you let the stuff that's getting presented be presented to you, and then you use all of the things at your disposal, and trust me, there's a lot more things at your disposal than most of us realise to determine truth. And the key is we use all of those things that are at our disposal to actually ask ourselves questions about, is this the truth that's being presented? Now, what's going to happen today, sometimes I'll say something and you will have a doubt. In fact, that will be pretty often, trust me today. All right? For many of you who have never heard this material before, Sometimes what I say will actually create anger. And I want to make a contract with you. If you feel like you're angry with me, my feeling is you've broken this contract between you and I. 
I'm giving you my time for free. I'm not expecting anything of you. I'm not expecting you to even listen to me. You, you can get up and leave at any time you wish. And of course, because it's for free, you're not going to lose anything except the time that you invested in this. So if you feel that way, if you feel you just cannot hear anymore, and trust me, there are probably going to be quite a few times where you feel that today. Allow yourself to feel the feeling, and if you really want to leave, leave. My suggestion is to just go outside and express some of the fear and doubt or anger, and even if you want to yell or scream about it, that's fine, I'm perfectly happy. And then come back and listen to a bit more and see how you feel about that. That would be my suggestion to you, but you don't have to do that, do that either. But one thing I do ask you is to own your emotions about what's being presented. Now, in a group of a couple of hundred people, if a few of us don't own our emotions, and we get really, you know, the Australian saying, you get your knickers in a knot, right? And before you know it, what's happening is a few of them are verbalising that in this auditorium. So rather than asking sincere questions, they want to dump their anger on AJ because of what he's saying. What happens is that destroys the experience for everybody present. So what I would like to ask you to do is to not do that. I'm perfectly happy to receive your angry emails. I'll give you my email address just for that purpose, if that's what you want to do afterwards. But if in this presentation, just for the sake of love of others, you can uh, allow yourself to feel those feelings, and if you still feel them at the end of the day, I'm very happy to hear from you about them. So. The key is how we respond to truth inside of ourselves emotionally. And if you feel any dissatisfaction feelings, there will be times when you feel doubt, anger, resentment. You will feel what some people and have called triggered. And I don't sort of like the term very much myself, but it's a term that's used quite often nowadays for emotional triggering. And my suggestion is to own those emotions as much as you can. All right, so do we have a contract, you and I, to actually own our own anger and not to express it to the rest of the auditorium here? Have we got that contract? Yeah. Okay. okay. And uh, by the way, if that does happen, I'll be, uh, I'll be stopping my conversation and reminding you of that contract. Does that make sense? Well, the first uh, thing I'd like to say is probably one of the most confronting things you will hear today. You see, when I'm producing, uh, like how, how arrogant is it of me to call a session Secrets of the Universe? Well, a lot of people would say it's very arrogant for me to even present something like that as if what I'm going about, is about to say, what I'm about to say are the secrets of the universe. By the way, I don't feel arrogant about it. I just feel very humbled that I've learned these things, as does every other person who's ever learnt them historically. But quite often what we do is we judge others through our personal feelings. The truth is that what I'm going to present to you are the secrets of the universe. They were lost many, many years ago, and uh, almost 2,000 years ago lost to this earth, and it's only recently that, the, that they've been represented back to the earth, and we'll discuss why that's the case. The reason why they're the secrets of the universe is that every single aspect of your entire life from now on, whether you know or not, is governed by these secrets. We're not talking about the secret, you know, the law of attraction that gets presented in the, in the presentation, the secret. I'm talking about a whole wide variety of laws and truths that govern your life moment by moment by moment, every single day. These are not religious laws. These are not political laws. These are laws that are a part of the universe that we're living in. And they not only govern your physical body and how it works, they govern also another body that you actually have, whether you know it or not, the spirit body. That Many of you 
are starting to connect to in your own discoveries. And that spirit body is governed by these laws too. But not only that, there's a whole part of ourselves, the majority of us, are just in the infancy of discovering. Just in the infancy of discovering. And that whole part, I would call the soul, and we'll talk about the soul later, and that part of you is also governed by all these different laws. And no matter what you do in your life, no matter what you even say in your life, is governed by all these different processes going on. That is a mixture of what ha is happening inside of you and what the laws of the universe are all doing with regard to responding to you. And what we'd like to do is present a summary of all of that today. Now, I'm today not going to be able to go into the nitty-gritties of each particular thing. Many of you will have little questions come up. And uh, some of those questions will apply to the topic. Some of those questions will be off topic. So what we're going to do today is if a question is off topic, I'll encourage you to come back tomorrow and ask that question. Tomorrow's session is free just like today. If the, t if the questions are on topic, we have two roaming, roaming microphones. Can we just stand up? Uh, Tristan's on one side and Anna is on the other side and they'll put a microphone in front of your face. <laughs> when you hold your microphone, by the way, can I just illustrate that? Hold it up nice, nice like that so that we can get the sound of your, of your voice and, uh, and you may even find a camera sort of focused towards you and we, to get your face on the, on the camera and hopefully you're okay with that and if you're not then just say no I don't want the camera on me and we'll take the camera away from you. But if you can hold up the microphone at least so that we can all hear the questions that you're asking. Thanks Mike. Now, the first question everyone asks me is, well, how do you know, you, you say you know the secrets of the universe, how do you know it? And I say, well, I've, I've learnt it in my life. And they say, well, like, who taught you these things? And I say, well, God taught me these things. And God taught me even how to learn these things. And then they say, well, when, when did all that occur? And I say to them, well, that all occurred a couple of thousand years ago in my experience. I've just had one experience, one life, and in that one life, which has lasted 2,000 years, um, I've experienced these things. And then they ask me, well, who were you 2,000 years ago? And here's your first confronting thing. <laughs> uh, I'm Jesus of the Bible. The person, Yeshua ben Joseph, the person that you would have seen in the Bible if you've read it. <laughs> most people nowadays haven't, of course. But most people have heard of me um, as Jesus. Not many have heard of me as AJ. Now, that raises a few questions straight away, doesn't it? Don't you think? You feel a bit of challenge there about that? Just felt the whole feeling just go down a bit there? Mm. And, and the first emotion was, oh, yeah, 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 I see that one, yeah, yeah, doubt, yeah, I see that one, and, uh, and so forth. There's only three possible um, choices you have with me saying that. Do you know that? There's only three possible choices. The first possible choice, which many of you right at the moment would then say is the most likely, is that I am uh, crazy and delusional. And to be frank with you, I've done these presentations with many thousands of people and the majority of them feel I'm crazy and delusional. Although in time, many change their mind. We'll look at that. The second possible option, um, what would that be, you think? What about this, that I'm devious? Or, or you could be more frank, let's be more frank. And a liar. That's second possible option. And the third possible option it has to be really that I'm telling the truth. Right. Now can you see, again, we've got choice, you've all got choice, and you've got a choice of three possible options. Now I might be a nice, fine, like loving, crazy and delusional person, but it doesn't change the fact that if 
if I am not the person I'm saying, then I am crazy and delusional, does it not? And the truth is too that I might not be a nice, fine and cra crazy person. I might actually be a devious person who actually wants to become some kind of messianic cult leader just for you to follow. And that might be the option. And I'm sorry if that freaks you out, but, but I can't do anything about that. That's an emotion inside of yourself. I don't want to be a cult leader. I just want to be myself. That's all I want to be. Or the third option is I'm telling the truth. And if I'm telling the truth, hmm, that's going to be a problem in its own self, isn't it? Can you see that? How do I tell someone else that I just met Jesus? That's going to be a bit hard. How do I, how do I listen to this stuff with an open mind when I've already made a judgment? Now, the reason why I'm saying who I am up front is because in previous presentations, what I've done is I've presented for three or four hours and then I told everybody who I was. And a lot of people went away feeling quite upset. And the reason why they went away feeling upset is because they feel like if I'd told them who I was right at the beginning, they wouldn't have stayed for the three hours and listened to the rest, right? And they just wasted three hours of their life. So I'm telling you right up front, and so uh, of course you're free to leave at any time because if this session is free and you won't even lose any money from it. How about that? So that's the options. Now, it's not very important to you who I am, if you think about it. It's only important to me who I am. Like, can I reverse that for you? It's not necessarily important to me who you are. It's only important to you mostly who you are. Can you see that in your life? Like each of us have an identity. Each of us have a history. Each of us have had a life. Each of us have experienced whole groups of things in our entire life, have we not? And that's your life. If someone came along and took all that away and rubbed it all out, you would be very confused, would you not? Like, where would you be? You'd be hopeful. You'd hope that that would happen. <laughs> But, but it would also create a lot of psychological confusion, trust me, because it's very, very difficult to actually not be who you are, although many would argue with that. Right? How many of you are still struggling to be who you are? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's something that we often struggle with. But what I'm talking about is from an identity perspective. We all have an identity, and my identity is no different to yours in that it's just my identity. It's just who I am. It's just my experience. And my life is no more important than yours, by the way. No more important than yours. You are just as important to this universe as am I. We both have the same amount of worth, if you like. So my saying that I'm Jesus doesn't mean that I'm saying I'm better than you. Can, can you understand that? All I'm saying is that's my identity. That's who I am. What, me saying I'm Jesus doesn't mean that I want you to listen to me. Because if I wanted you to listen to me, I'd lock the doors, uh, have a few security guards around, maybe with machine guns might be good, and we'd just keep you all in line. So I've got you for four hours, you know. I would try to use techniques or whatever that would try to make you feel bad, and then, and then you listen. And I don't want you to feel bad about yourself. All I want to be able to do is present some truth to you. But you don't have to listen to that truth. And you don't even have to believe it's truth. You don't have to accept anything. It's up to you what you accept. Also, if I want to take your money at some time in the future, I'm very certain you'll find that out sometime in the future, wouldn't you? So you, you can work through that emotion if that's what you want and feel that I'm going to and, and leave these truths behind just because you feel I might do that. That's up to you. By the way, many have done that in the past, both in the first century when I was on earth and now, where they thought that. Also, many feel that when me, my saying that I'm Jesus, just like many people when I said I was the Messiah in the first century, had a huge reaction to that. They felt lots and lots of different emotions that were powerful in them. And as a res response to that, they couldn't listen to what I was presenting to them. And just recently I talked to a group of people who 2,000 years ago couldn't listen to something that I said. And for 2,000 years, in the, a different dimensional space than where we are here, sitting here, they had stayed locked up with that emotion. 
So my suggestion to you is don't let what I say lock you up emotionally. Just allow it to pass through you. If you don't agree with it, move on like with your life. Allow other things to come to you. If you want to experiment with it, then by all means experiment with it and I'll do everything that I can and I'm already trying to do everything that I can to help you experiment with these truths. So what I would like to do is, well, I wanted to do that just to tell you who I was because from now on you won't hear much about me. What I want to talk about mostly is the secrets of the universe. I want to start with one of the best kept secrets of the universe. And you're going to laugh, perhaps, that you think it's the best kept secret, but it is actually, because very few people know this, know this secret. And that's the secret of God. Whenever I say the word God, what do you feel? Well, if I come from a religious background, like I come from, let's say I come from Catholicism, my feeling might be straight away, well, you know, God's a punishing God. I don't believe in the punishing God thing, so therefore I don't accept religion and I don't accept anyone talking about God anymore in my life. So as soon as we hear the word God, straight away turn off. If we talk about God and we happen to be an atheist, what do we feel now? There is no God. What are you talking about? Why start a conversation on the secrets of the universe and there, when there is no God? Like that, so that might be quite confronting. If I was speaking to a Muslim, they would feel that, that I'd be talking about Allah, the one true and only God. And a Christian, of course, may feel that way, although a Christian, some Christians feel that God is three in one God, like God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And there's all these feelings, aren't they, that are all different, all defining God. If I was in the New Age movement, what I feel God is, I feel oh, God's within me, so I'm God. Right? So you hear that all the time, don't you? Like, I'm God, you're God, we're all God. Isn't it wonderful how good we've got our lives together? God's got her life together, right? <laughs> it doesn't feel that way to me at the moment, so you know, maybe that's not true, but that's what we're told, and we start to think that's a good idea, and so along we go with that. And so all of these concepts of God are bombarded at us that are all actually based around emotional injuries generally, all sorts of injuries. And a lot of the injuries are based around things what happened with our parents. So if we've got an autocratic, domineering, punishing father, we'll often then, whenever we hear the word God, we automatically emotionally feel mm, autocratic, domineering God, you know. He makes this whole universe, throws away the book, and then makes us live in it without any guidance. But we may have that feeling. Some of us may have good feelings about God because we've actually received some things from God that we've enjoyed and so we have some good feelings about God. But to be frank, that's a fairly rare thing on this planet. Most people have very, very rigid viewpoints of God. So I'd like to talk about God for a little bit. To me, it's the longest discussion I'd ever like to have with somebody is about God, but most people can't cope with much of it at this point. So what I do is I introduce God to you. God is an entity. God is not just an energy. You know how so, so many times we feel that, or we're told that God is love. You heard that statement? God is love? I agree totally with that statement, by the way. God is love. But there is a statement that I don't agree with, and that is... Love is God. I don't agree with that. The reason why I don't agree with that is because love is a quality of God. God, the entity, has this quality, which is not only just an emotion, but it's a substance that God has, of love. So love itself isn't God, because God has other qualities. So God has a quality of intelligence, creative intelligence. God has the quality of wisdom. God has the quality of power. God has the quality of understanding. God has the quality of absolute truth. All of these qualities belong to God, but they don't mean that absolute truth is God. It means it's one of God's attributes or qualities. Does that make sense to everyone? There's a difference between focusing on the attribute or quality and focusing on the, where that attribute and quality came from. 
So, when you look at God, my suggestion is, just for a moment, consider the possibility that God is actually an entity that has qualities and attributes. Just like you are an entity that has qualities and attributes. Unique qualities and attributes, in fact. In fact, we could get all of you together and compare your lives and every single one of your lives will have similar things that might have happened. Like, for instance, most of you would have attended a school somewhere. But what happened when you attended school and all the different interactions you had will be very individual and unique. And what I'm saying to you is God is an entity that created the universe, the source of all matter and the source of all creation, the source, in fact, not only of that, but of all laws that control those things, is this entity God. This entity God, I personally do not completely understand. And I've been living for 2,000 years trying, in fact, it's been my sole focus for 2,000 years trying to understand. And I still do not understand the entity God completely. There's whole areas of God that as I progress spiritually and as I progress in love, I find, oh, wow, I, I didn't realize that before here in my heart. You know, I had an intellectual concept, but I couldn't feel it until a certain point in my life. And one of the things is that God is love. That's one of the first things that I did learn. But I also learned that love is not God. Love was a quality of God. In fact, a quality of God that God could give to me. And God has lots of different qualities, actually, that God can give to you. And a lot of it depends upon the asking. But we'll talk about that in a minute. So there's God. God is also has, you could say, some primary characteristics or attributes, primary things. Let's call them these two things. Divine truth, or you could just substitute for the word divine, absolute truth. Absolute truth is the domain of the creator. And divine love. Or you could also use the term again, absolute love. Absolute love is the divine, is the domain of the creator. So this is my creator. The reason why I've got it drawn like that, God drawn like that, is because God also has masculine and feminine characteristics. So you'll hear me sometimes refer to God as my father. And you'll also hear me refer to God as my mother. I very rarely say mother, father, God. The reason why I very rarely do that is because every single attribute of God usually has a masculine or feminine trait. And when I allow myself to feel God completely, I'll feel what trait is allocated with what particular attribute. For example, the attribute of creation, God's creative power, is definitely the domain of the she. So I call, usually when I talk about my creator, I usually speak of her, my creator. There are other qualities like the maintenance of the universe is another quality that God has. And what I do there is I talk about a he generally because generally that is a masculine type of a characteristic, something that maintains, you know, and if you think about it, wow, that sort of relates a lot to our earthly life in a way, doesn't it? Like, you know, how many times does the wife ask the husband to fix the, you know, tap or something? How many times does the husband ask the wife to do it? No. You know, generally a lot less, right? So you can see how there's definitely masculine and feminine traits even inside of each one of us. But it definitely is in the Creator. So the Creator, the source of all divine truth, the source of all absolute truth, uh, needs a H there, and the source of all divine love, or the source of all absolute love, where she came from, I don't know. And in 2,000 years, I have not been able to discover it. I feel that sooner or later, she might try to show me where she came from. But when you think about it, that also makes sense in a way, because 
It's a bit like you building a car and then the car being able to understand you, isn't it? That, that requires a lot of intelligence on the part of the car. The car really has to be you to understand you. So you can see that if, if I wanted to fully understand the Creator, I in the end would have to be the Creator, which is not really something that's possible as far as I'm currently aware. No? So all right, so God's got these qualities. Masculine, feminine traits, and these big major qualities of divine truth and divine love. And what does God do with them? But well, what God has done with them is desired, and she desired to actually have children to express her love to. Right? And so what happened? It was there was these heaps of little tiny, you could call them souls, that were created. And there's a saying that comes from the Bible in God's image. So each one of these little souls have masculine and feminine traits and there's billions of them being created. When God desires to do something, she doesn't laze around and she doesn't wait very often at all. And in fact, what she has a tendency to do is just keep going, <laughs> keep creating. And the way the universe is designed, and we'll see when we get down to the technicals of the universe, the way the universe is divine, designed is in exactly the same way. Now, God, this creator, the source of all existence, created these little beings to experience her love, but she gave them the choice to do so. You've all heard of that. It's called free will. Most of you would have heard of free will. You've all got free will, the ability to make choice. Although sometimes in this world it doesn't feel like free will very much, does it? Like when it comes to taxation time, not much free will going on there. Like That's what it feels like. But in reality... We all have complete autonomy, complete free will. That's how God created us. But when God created us in this state, which is what you would call a complete soul state, God as yet didn't give us the ability to know ourselves. God, God just created everything and then set in motion a series of processes the first process was a process of what I call incarnation. And we'll talk about incarnation in a minute as we progress. Now God also created a universe. But God was very clever the way she created the universe. She didn't actually physically create the universe. Or very, in fact, very little of the universe did she physically create. What she did instead was created all of the laws that created the universe. Right? So she created a heap of laws that allow us to be involved in creation, the human soul. There are no so we've got God, the original, the origin of all of this universe, and now we've got these little souls, if you like. We'll draw them over here. These little souls with masculine and feminine traits all over here in a place waiting to do things, waiting to do something. Now, I want to state a, first, a few things about that, those souls. Firstly, they don't know they exist yet. So they are not conscious of self in this state. So the very first time you were created, you didn't even know when that was. Can, if you think about it, you'll actually, if you go right way, way back to a first incarnation, wherever that was, and we'll talk about when that was later, when you go way back to a first incarnation, you can't remember before then. You can't remember where you were. Because we weren't conscious of ourselves. We also did not know how to express free will. So we did not express free will yet. To, have a, to, to express our will, we have to be conscious of ourselves. The two are dependent upon each other, you see. 
if we're not conscious of ourselves, how do we know we've even got a will? We don't. So at this state, we're not even conscious of ourselves, we don't know we have a will. In this state, though, there are a number of things we do have, even though we're not conscious of them. We have a thing called sexuality, a characteristic called sexuality. We have a, a all inst these are all instinctual of the soul, not the body. I'm not talking about the body here. I'm talking about this creation of God called the soul. We'll talk more about it as we go along. We have a, we have a, a connection with the universe that we're unaware of as well in this state. Right? So, so in this state, we know we don't know anything about ourselves, and we don't know anything about our environment, but we are, we are still connected to the environment even though we're unaware. We have lots of other characteristics and traits. So I've written some down. I can't remember them all just at the moment because I'm, uh, I've just realised that I've missed quite a lot of what I wanted to say to you. Um, but we'll get back to them. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that we do have some instinctual things. Instinct. instinct. Um, one of the instincts that we have in this state is the instinct to do a thing called incarnate. You've heard of that before? We often hear the word reincarnate, right? But very rarely of, is we, do we hear, hear the word incarnate. We'll talk about the process of incarnation of this original soul. There was, there was a time, there's a time in every single soul's existence where that first step to incarnation occurs, the very first time you ever came to Earth or to a place like Earth, shall we say. You have lots of different things in that state, but you do not have a consciousness of self. And there's only one way to gain a consciousness of self that God created, and that is to do the process of incarnation. Now, what God did too, so we'll just come back to this, what God did too is God created a universe. Remember I said that God created not so much the universe but the potential of the universe's existence. And what God did then is involve us in this process of creation. But what it is, is we have lots of what are called interdimensional spaces in the universe. How many have I got so far? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right. There's actually 22 at the moment. But one thing about the universe is that it is, it is always expanding in terms of every new dimension that's created. And it's also, in each dimension, expanding laterally. So every single dimension is expanding sideways, if you like, and every new dimension gets created one more than the other. And each is separated by what you would call an interstellar boundary. The interstellar boundary is a boundary of love. And this is one of the secrets of the universe. Understand that the only way to progress from one dimensional space to another dimensional space is to grow in love. That's the only way. Now, there are literally groups of lots of people in different dimensions who believe there's other ways but they will only ever grow to certain condition in that state and never grow any further. And it's almost a natural thing that people start growing in love, and we'll talk about that in, turn, in the future as well. So we've got these interstellar boundaries of love separating these dimensional spaces. We call these dimensions, shall we? Or what many spirits call them, spheres. S-P-H-E-R-E-S, -E -E spheres. But if you can call, you can think of them as either into these dimensional spaces or spheres. Now, up until two thousand years ago, there was only the sixth sphere in creation. 
between 2,000 years ago and now, another 14 spheres, sorry, 16, 6 plus, 16 spheres have been created. But they weren't created by God. They were created by God's laws being in condition where the first person who entered the new sphere created the dimensional space. So what happened historically is God, you could say that the earth in in its original state was created and all of the people who were were before in their pre-incarnation condition were all about in the sixth sphere of the creation. And what happened was over a period of time on the earth, mankind's condition degraded and so new dimensional spaces of love had to be created so that they could live in them. So the first person who soul degraded in condition to a fifth sphere condition created the fifth sphere. And the next person, the first person who, cre- who soul conditioned to the four, degraded to the fourth sphere created the fourth sphere. It actually happened very, very rapidly historically, these creation of the spheres in a downward direction. And so we ended up with six spheres. And so if you look historically at a lot of texts that have been discovered prior to 2,000 years ago, and even after for a fair time, you'll find that whenever they talk about dimensional spaces, they often only talk about six or seven of them. And you may have found that in your own discovery when you've read some spiritual literature, for example. And then we had the creation of other spheres, and these other spheres all got created by the first person who entered those spheres. Okay? And as that person entered the sphere, the sphere got created. And then as the next person entered that sphere, it expanded. Each single person that enters a new dimensional space expands or creates even more a part of that dimensional space. So you can think of all of these as dimensional spaces of existence, of which there are now known to be 22 dimensional spaces. We're right up to there? Now, by the way, you may ask questions. (laughs) So you can stop me at any point and ask a question about any of these things. So I'm perfectly happy to answer questions. What we'll do, though, is make sure it's the microphone. So, Tris, if we can come down. Paul, when you're mentioning about the qualities, you're talking about sexuality. Did you mean gender? No, I don't mean gender. And I'll, I'll describe more sexuality um, as we talk more about the soul itself, because we, we will be talking a lot of detail about the soul. Okay. Yep. And part B, <laughs> yep. for the question, when you're talking about the expansion, are you talking in a physical sense? Because you're saying sideways, which is a direction. Um, I'm talking in a physical sense, yes. The universe, the, each dimension has physical matter in it. It's not matter of the same type as the matter that we have here in this dimension, but it is physical matter. When you go to these dimensions, which you will do, usually most of us go there when we pass, that's the first time we go to another dimension, you'll find that that dimension has houses, It has rocks, it has grass, it has trees, birds, animals, it has all sorts of things. It's all in a different, but it's a different subliminated form of matter. But it is still matter. It is still matter that you can touch and feel and sense and taste and hear, see, everything is still... And in fact, you will feel when you enter that state that you feel it more strongly, you can touch it and it feels... More, you feel it more, you can taste it and everything tastes more sensational and so forth, you'll find that actually as you progress with your soul, everything grows in capacity and, not, and is not reduced in capacity. So just like last question, yep. um, so therefore the senses that we currently know of, the five, yep, senses, the five senses, are still with us and continue to expand? They continue to expand and in fact we have senses added to each form. So, so while you have what we know as sensorily as the five senses to the physical form, the spirit body has far more senses. And then the soul itself has far more senses again. Each, each 
part of us is actually a superset of the previous condition. So this is something to be aware of in our own growth. Yeah. Now we can actually in, become in tune with many of these other parts of us that we're only using five senses now, but we can actually become in tune with these many other parts of our sensory apparatus while we're still in the physical form. And many people you've heard of have done that, right? People who many of you refer to as gurus or people who are avatars, some of them have started developing these other senses. And in fact, there is a wide variety of senses that is available to every single person on this planet to develop. We're all created the same in that way. Thank you. All right. And up the back, Beatrice. Yeah, um, one thing that I thought, and I suppose other people do as well, is that um, when you die, and when you died as Jesus, I, my belief system was that everything was revealed after death. And yep. What you're saying is that ain't, that ain't the way. <laughs> no, that's true. I'm saying that's not true. Yeah, that's correct. And so the truth is when you pass, you will know exactly what you know right now, no more, except that you've passed, the instant you pass. However, the instant you pass, there'll be a number of different events that will occur quite rapidly after that, where you'll know a larger amount in a very quick time, but it doesn't mean that you'll know the secrets of the universe. You will have to discover them, and in fact, most people never discover them for thousands and thousands of years. I've spoken to people in other dimensions who have taken 20, 30, 50, 70,000 years to discover some of these secrets that you're being told today. So the truth is, when you pass, you are not all of a sudden some all-knowing being directly connected to God. That, that is just not a truth. You are not directly connected to God just because you passed. And you don't, you don't automatically know everything just because you've passed. And this is one of the problems of what I would call med mediumship problems. You know, a lot of times we, some people of us finish up getting to the state where we start to accept that there's other dimensional existences. And so what we then realize is that there's some people in our, in our world and some in this audience too that can actually communicate with these other dimensional beings, right? And so they, we go along to one of them and we start communicating and we ask them questions and we assume one fatal assumption and that is that the person we're asking in the spirit world actually knows and has experienced the answer of what we're asking. And that is not a truth. You see, they are just as opinionated as we are, right? And they think they know things that they know nothing about many times, just like we do. And so just because a person's in the spirit world or a person's in these other dimensions, shall we say, either one is fine because it's the same thing, just because a person's in the spirit world, it doesn't mean that they actually know the truth of what they're talking about on any question that you ask them. If you can imagine for a moment that all of a sudden you pass, you've got the same mind that you have, because later we'll show you where the mind is, you've got exactly the same mind that you've got right now. You've got exactly the same, in fact, all of your experiences that you have right now are exactly the same as the moment you pass, aside from the fact that you've now had the one extra experience, and that is, I passed. Right? And I now know that there is this thing called life after death. In fact, after a while, when I think about it in the spirit world, I realize, oh, I don't know if I can really call it death because nothing really happened aside my physical body and I start seeing my physical body, oh, that was just a tool, really. Like, that's just a, like an apparatus, like a robot, you know, that I can use to experience the spirit, this physical world. And I realize that, and I go, wow, oh, well, I didn't really pass at all. All that happened is I changed my state. That's all that happened, nothing else. Now, if that's all that happens, I just changed my state, that doesn't mean I become some all-knowing being all of a sudden. I still have to learn, discover, and grow. And what's that dependent upon? That's dependent upon my open-mindedness, my open-heartedness, and a lot of other qualities that if I develop them here on earth, I'm going to be in great store in the spirit world. You know, I'm going to go very well in the spirit world if I develop them here on earth. But if on the earth I go down the other track, which is the track of 
becoming very close-minded, rigid, not, you know, all of those kind of things, what's going to happen is I'm going to arrive in the spirit world with all this rigidity, close-mindedness in exactly the same condition. And somebody comes along and tells me, oh, actually, you're in the first sphere, this one. What? 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 It's sphere? First sphere. You're in the first sphere. Do you mean there's more spheres? Yeah. I don't believe you. I can only believe what I can see. How many of you times have you heard that on earth? I can only believe what I can see. Do you think that's going to go when you pass? No, it's not going to go. You pass and you'll only believe what you see if you retain that emotional belief. So, oh yeah, oh yeah, I, I can see that's where I came from, the earth, and I can see that that had a body and I haven't got that body anymore and I can go there to that earth and I touch the person's body and wow, I can put my hand right through their body. Now that's a bit weird, so that's different, you know, that's something that's new. And I discover all of these things through my personal experience. And then I start trusting, like, oh, what he said to me was true. He said that I'd be able to do that. Maybe I should have a listen to him about some more things that he might know. And I start to discover that actually some other people know more than I do about this new world that I'm, or this new dimension that I'm living in. And so I go off discovering all these beautiful things in this dimension. The first one. And because uh, most of us, by the way, pass into the first one. And, uh, and that's something that we need to address here on Earth because the first one is a far cry from where God created us to be. So, so we want to deal with that and have more bliss in our lives than what we'll experience in the first bit. So most of us pass there, we have all this process of discovery going on still, just like you have right here, right now. Exactly the same, really, except as all the spirits who are here listening, and there's quite a lot of them, as all of them know, you know a few things because you passed. That's the only difference. What we want to do is pre-know the things that we're going to experience a little. And I don't mean that, we, that we're close-minded once we pre-know it. What I mean is we want to open our mind and heart to the fact that this might be possible. Because if we open our mind and heart to the fact now, when it comes there and we're shown and somebody talks to us about it, we go, oh, I've heard this before. And that's going to help us a lot in our future life. Right? And that's why it's so important. There are literally billions and billions and billions of people who have passed from this earth, who are still stuck in this first sphere place, in places where they're still experiencing terrible, terrible emotions, and the main reason why is because they don't want to listen to anyone. They don't want to get out of that state because they just don't want to listen to somebody. And so we don't want to do that. That, that would be a huge waste of our life. And I've talked to many, like I've said previously, that have waited in that state thousands and thousands of years in that state, not wanting to listen to anybody thinking that the life they currently have is the life that they can only create. How many people on earth think that? The majority, don't they? How many on earth think that the life we currently have is the only life we can create? Quite a lot of people on earth believe that. So I'm suggesting don't believe that and also don't assume you're automatically going to be all-knowing because you are not going to be all-knowing as soon as you pass. Is there any other questions? Um, down the front here and then up the back on this side. Um, if my body develops in the physical, mm -hmm. down on this earth, are my senses, are they also developing more then? Or my sensitivity develops more? Or We'll answer the questions of development later in our presentation, but just one thing to understand is actually the soul changing is what causes all development of all senses. So we'll talk about how we can change the soul as we go on in our discussion. But it's important to understand that you can spend a lot of time on your physical body developing something when you could do it in a fraction of the time if you develop your soul. Right? So you're far better off developing your soul. So for example, many of us have become very health conscious. Who's pretty health conscious in the audience? Yeah, good. Well, half, three quarters of the, of the audience. 
you can become health conscious, so what do you do? You start you know, picking out this food, picking out, no, I don't have that food, I don't eat that food anymore. We start making some rules for ourselves about what we eat and so forth, and we become quite health conscious. We, you know, oh, there's, oh, oh, there's a bit of ache there, I wonder what that's about. We rush off to a naturopath or a healer or whatever else, and we work out what that's about, and we work through that emotion, and then we do the same with whatever is going on in our self. And then, you know, when we're 40 or 50 or maybe earlier, we you know, get cancer maybe. And then, wow, there's something else I don't work out here, something's going on and I change my diet a bit more and then I realise, oh, there's some emotions starting to be connected to these, these diseases. And I start realising some things about that and I might work through the emotion that created my cancer and then I deal with other things going on in my body that way. But initially we're very focused on the physical, aren't we? when we start caring for ourselves. And I'm suggesting it for yourself, don't stop caring for yourself physically, but you will need to start looking at caring for yourselves at the soul level. Because if you care for yourself at the soul level, everything else will change in the most rapid possible way. And that's just something to bear in mind for the future discussion. And um, question? Okay. I have a question about the uh, being within the spheres. At any one time, like for instance right now, are we within this one sphere or could we be visiting other spheres at the same time? Are we solely encapsulated within one at any time because we have these teachers and like yourself, for instance, standing there saying you have this knowledge and sharing it with us. Um, does that mean that you could perhaps be in more than one sphere at a time? The truth is right now all of us are in the sphere that our soul condition, and we'll talk more about our soul condition in a, in a minute, that our soul condition is in love. So how much we love depends on how, what spheres we can travel to. So if I love to the extent that I, can li I could live if I passed in the third sphere, then even in my physical state, I can travel from earth to the first sphere, the second sphere, or the third sphere. But I can't go any further. Because it's, each sphere has a dimensional bound, has an interstellar boundary, and the inter interstellar boundary is a boundary of a certain level of love. And if my soul hasn't developed enough in that particular aspect of love, I cannot cross that boundary. That's the only thing that prevents me from travelling through different dimensions. So if on the earth, I'm on the earth, and I develop my soul, I can develop my soul to the 22nd sphere while I live on earth. Now, in the first century, I developed my soul until the tenth sphere when I was on earth. So all I could do is go, when I passed in the spirit world, I could go to the tenth sphere or any sphere below that. But I couldn't go above that. And I had to develop my soul in love more to go to the eleventh sphere and the twelfth sphere and so forth. Does that make sense? So each sphere is a, has a boundary of love preventing you from pro progressing into that sphere. And unless your soul resonates with that boundary, in other words, unless there is a... And this is why people talk about vibration, right? They call the interstellar boundary a certain level of vibration. My suggestion to you is forget all the vibration nonsense. It's not nonsense in the sense that it, it's, there is a vibration, there is a physical vibration when you go there, but it's nonsense in the sense that it doesn't tell you the full truth. The full truth is that it's love that you're experiencing to a certain level. And it's about your growth in love. If you just focus on that, that's a lot simpler than asking what vibration is it that I've got to work through. You know, If you just ask what level of love, what are the lessons of love that I've got to learn before I can make this transition from the third sphere to the fourth sphere, by a spirit, any spirit, by the way, who's made that transition will be able to tell you. And you'll be able to progress very, very rapidly when you work your way that, through, through that. So understand that this metaphysical stuff and we'll talk about metaphysics soon, the metaphysical stuff, if that becomes your focus, it's going to actually distract you from the truth of the universe in that everything is based around love, every bit of development that you can do. Now, for many of us, we'll feel like, wow, that's pretty good, because that's nice and simple, isn't it? Don't you think? So simple that a, who could a, a child can understand. Right? Anyone can understand that. A child can experience the experience of love and understand what love is 
so a child can understand the secrets of the universe. When we start going in and reading all the scientific literature and we go down all this multidimensional space and then we start reading all of the scientific stuff with physics and then we start doing the inter stellar mathematical boundaries, there are all these calculations that all the, all the mathematicians go down. Wow, that just starts getting real complicated now, doesn't it? Can you see that? And it takes us away from the truth of, the, of it. The simple truth is that it's all just progression in love. So that's a beautiful truth to remember all your life. That's the truth I've tried to remember all my life. When we incarnate and say, for example, we have reached level four and we incarnate, is there any chance that when we pass we can go to a lower level or depending, on, I guess, on what we're doing on this plane or is the progression generally up? Well, firstly, your question betrays a number of different errors about the process of incarnation that we'll have to address. And we'll address those when we talk about incarnation and where we incarnate to. And you're, you're really asking a question regarding reincarnation, right? Not incarnation. And when I was talking about the first, the very first incarnation that we experience, mm -hmm. and so, you know, I want to address the difference between that incarnation and reincarnation. So there's a very different answer for those questions depending on, you know, where we're coming from. But, in answer to the question about whether you can degrade in condition, yes, you can. Of course, remember, I can grow in love just as much as if I make different choices, I can actually degrade in love. So if I choose to make a choice that causes my soul to degrade in love, I can certainly get into a worse condition. Thank you. Does that make sense? I'll answer the other questions when we talk about the, reincarn the incarnation and reincarnation process. All right? So bear in mind that if you make a choice inside of yourself that's disharmonious with love, your what we will call soul condition, and I'll describe what that is shortly, degrades. And when you make a choice that's harmonious with love and you feel that choice in your heart, your soul condition expands. And to be frank with you, most of you can feel that happening, right? You feel the joy of making choices harmonious with love. You think about the different qualities that are harmonious with love. When you're generous with someone without wanting something back, how, does you, how do you feel when you do that? You feel the truth of there's more happiness in giving than receiving, right? And you feel that inside of yourself, so you just grew a bit in love. But when you make a choice out of anger and resentment to harm somebody, you know, like, uh, you know, she stole my boyfriend. Uh, you know, I think I'm going to do some things to break up that rela new relationship, right? So I tell some lies here and tell some lies there. Do I feel good about that, really? Like, I might be angry and I might get... But when I go back and reflect upon it and have to tell somebody else about what I've done, how does, what does it feel like then inside of myself? Usually not very good, right? We think, oh, that wasn't very nice. So we automatically have these barometers inside of us. One of the instinctual barometers is when we display love compared to when we don't. But we certainly can degrade in love. Uh, any other questions? If I come down to Harry and then across. Um. You've described these different levels of um, love. What would you have to experience to pass from one, or what would you have to feel to pass through one level to the next? Like, for instance, how would you... Well, let me describe the first, the second, the third sphere transition for you. All right, just one aspect of this transition is this. To get from the second sphere of love to the third sphere, which, remember, they are different dimensions, they're actually different places of existence, that are much happier, much more joyful, and to be frank, they are also much more beautiful in each case. To get from the second to the third sphere, I have to learn a primary lesson about love, in that love always tells the truth no matter what the consequence. Now, to describe to you how fine that is, you wake up in the morning, your wife says, how are you? 
You say, I feel good, when actually you're feeling quite afraid. You just lie. You are now, you are not in the, that condition of love yet. Does that make sense? If, if you, your wife asks you, oh, you know, were you out with someone last night? And you think, oh, yeah, well, we went out for work and there were some women there, but my wife's a bit jealous and she might, you know, think that there was something going on when there wasn't. And so it's better if I just don't tell her the truth, right? Because otherwise there might be an argument, she might flare up and I avoid, so I avoid her jealousy by actually saying, well, no, no, I was just at work. I'm just not in that condition of love yet, in that condition where I could make the transition between the second and the third sphere. Does that make sense? So, so just the condition of telling the truth to myself and to everyone else around me is the transition between the second and the third sphere. Now, how, many, how much of the earth is in that state? Very, very few people on this planet are in that state. And if we're honest with ourselves, we can see in our own life, you know, often we just tell a little fib here, withhold the truth there, and before we know it, what we've done is we've prevented ourselves from making that transition. Now, when you make that transition, what goes through you is this amazing realisation that actually every time I'd say the exact truth as it is, to absolutely every single person around me, no matter what their response is, that it gives me this freedom and it also, that there's this beautiful feeling that passes through you every time, that you've honoured yourself and honoured your feelings and your emotions and honoured the truth. And you grow immensely through this transition of in, from the second to the third sphere. But what often happens is we are so afraid of other people's emotions we are so afraid that someone might like us. We're so afraid that some, of, of those kind of emotions coming from other people that we lock ourselves in this place where we can't progress beyond that second sphere state. And to be frank, there is very, when I say very few people on earth, historically have ever gone to their spirit world in the third sphere state. That is the truth. And you can, just for that one reason, that they haven't actually stated and lived in harmony with the truth while they're on earth all their life. Now, it may seem like a large demand, but actually, when you get into that state emotionally, it's so easy to do and so enjoyable. And every single interaction we have with every single person is truthful. And it's such a beautiful place to be when we make that transition. But the majority don't make that transition until we hit the spirit world sometime, and then we make that transition. Does that answer that question? Uh, there's a microphone coming. Thank you. I'm coming here this morning. I was quite uh, confused. I, I, I have complete attraction, yet I had... Fear. Fear. Yep. Yeah. And I, I, I was very, very emotionally stirred up. Yep. How many of the rest of you felt that way? Emotionally stirred up about coming here today? Yeah, quite a few. No? Not very many of you. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> and um, but coming to this issue, um, are we born loving? Unconditionally loving, the first incarnation? First incarnation, the question is, are we born loving? Um, now, to answer this question, we've got to understand the difference between birth and conception and incarnation. The truth is that when we incarnate, it's not at the time of our birth. It's actually at the time of our conception or shortly after. So the question then would have to become, when I am conceived, was I conceived? When, with me being in a loving state. And yes, the, just the moment before you were conceived, you were in a six-sphere natural love state. Just the moment before you were conceived. And what I'm going to do later is talk about what happened after that to make me not feel that state anymore. <laughs> Does that make sense? But at the moment we were conceived, we were in that state. Because of the other question I have, uh, do we, can we prevent um, self-reliance? 
And certainly we can. And we'll talk about all of those things when we talk about soul progression, which is coming up in the future. Today, I mean. Yep. Thank you. All right. Is there any questions more about the spheres? Any more questions about the spheres? Yep. Hey, Jay, is there a chart that you've done with the levels of love that you have to achieve to go through to each sphere? Um, no, there's no correlation uh, chart of all the different the things in love that you need to discover to go through each sphere. Because you understand that to do so would be, be present to you a whole intellectual argument. And none of the progression above the sixth sphere can happen intellectually. And in fact, the majority of the progression underneath the sixth sphere can't happen intellectually either. So you get hit with a chart with all these different things. Most of us would feel totally overwhelmed because literally there are thousands and thousands of lessons allocated to the progress of all of these in all of these spheres. We would look at that and we would go, wow, that's a pretty daunting task. Like, I don't know if I want to bite that off for the rest of my life. So we wouldn't be in the experiential zone of it. And also we would look at it and then we would try to manufacture it with our mind. And to be frank with you, the majority, there's a, the majority of people who have passed in the spirit world are trying to manufacture it with their mind and are failing because this progression is not about the mind. All progression, in fact, is not about the mind. So you know when people talk about the mind of God and growing with the mind of this and, and all of that kind of stuff? If you just cross out the word mind and put in place the word soul, you'll have a far better understanding of what's going on in the universe. Right? because the mind is not capable of actually growing in love. You think about that for a moment. Somebody comes along, they've never experienced love all of their life. It reminds me of that, you know, the movie Tarzan, the old movie Tarzan, you know, where he's never had a relationship with another person all of his life. And then Jane comes along. <laughs> and he's going, whoa. <laughs> like that. And there's this huge reaction going on. His first experience of love. Now, just before that point, could you imagine sitting down with Tarzan and saying, well, you know, mate, the way love is, is, it, is this is what it's like. It's this and it's that, and you're trying to intellectually describe all of the things love is to them. Now, do you think Tarzan would have understood a single, single word of that at the time? No. But as soon as he felt the emotion, now, what's this emotion? You know, this emotion that just drives me. Ah. Oh, and somebody comes along and says, oh, see that emotion? That's love. That's now love. That's what you're feeling. Now he understands, doesn't he? Because he's experienced. And this is the thing with all of this progression. You will never be able to learn it with your mind. You are going to need to experience it to learn it. And that's a very important thing to remember in your life. And remember that when we talk about love, we are talking about an emotion. An emotion that our minds still really don't understand. Right? We're only going to understand it at the soul level, this thing called love. It's a great little thing called love. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're going to come to understand. By the way, I occasionally do this breakout in song. And I must apologise if it puts you off. Right. <laughs> I'm not as good as Elvis, that for sure. All right, so um, so what we're doing is we're learning about love, you know, and you know the Every Lee Brothers sing this song, "Love hurts, love." You know, it's, honestly, what we think we know about love on this planet is just a lot of lies. All right. And so we need to come to discover what love really is. And we'll talk about love in a minute, though. Is there any more questions about the dimensional spaces, though? What's going on with the dimensions? Over here, thanks. If you can put, leave your hand up so Anna can see. That's it. How's it? Yeah, is, are the levels, the spheres, um, are they like the levels that um, Munro teaches from the Munro Light Institute in America with the focus levels. They have the same um, sort of levels, but they are for the soul's growth through experience in, this, in different stages in the soul's growth, or, or is it just um, a progress of love, an ongoing progress of love? Um, 
what I would like to do is sort of wrap up all of the different types of um, descriptions that people have given on the planet of the first seven spheres and wrap them all up and say, while many of the things are presenting about what is in each sphere and what is the state emotionally about each sphere are true, the best way to understand it is it's just about love. It's all about love. And if you understand it this way, you will progress through those states much more rapidly than if you try to do all the metaphysical things that these places, a lot of these different teachers suggest. And I'm, and I'm going to lump, and I know this might sound quite arrogant, but I'm going to lump all of those teachings into a thing called the natural love path, which we'll talk about in a minute. And they are not, my, my suggestion is, they are not going to be the fastest way for you to progress in your life towards a life of bliss. But they can be very helpful intellectually to get you to emotionally open. But they are not always going to assist you on your everlasting progress. So, so I know that's a very general answer, but, but the truth is there's literally thousands and thousands and thousands of teachings on this planet that refer to this progress, which I'll refer to as natural love progress, and it's not, you know, you've heard it all of them before in different guises, really. And if you think back on all of these different things that you've heard, they're all just the same thing presented in different language in many cases. And what I want to do is present to you a different path of progression, which is not known on the earth, although many people believe they know it. And I would like to discuss with you what that path is, what that path does and how easy it is. And remember, I'm saying it's, well, perhaps I should say it's simple to understand, but not easy to do. And in the first century, I called it the narrow way that leads to life. And what I would lump all these other things in is the broad way. Right? It leads to a six-sphere condition, not as if anybody knows their Bible. The Bible actually now says broad way leading to destruction. It's not like that at all. They all lead to a six-sphere condition, which is this condition here, but they never result in further progression after that. And my suggestion is to start giving up those ways and just focus your entire life on progressing in love. And you'll rapidly transcend most of those teachings. Thank you. No worries. Is there any other questions on the subject? If we can come, come down to... So, um, I came here first time in the, I hope it's not silly question, but yeah. I'm just wondering, the AJ talks about these, and the, there's a many layers, and how do I find um, exactly which position is? Right, which position you're in is what you're asking. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, my suggestion is to give up that completely, to give up the desire for you to know where you are at this point. Right? Now, when I say the majority of us, the majority of the earth is in this first sphere state, I'm telling you a truth. Now, that means the majority of us in the audits are going to be in that state. Right? Now, you can see just the transition between the second and the third sphere state, most of us haven't made, right? Because how many times in a day do I withhold the truth, not tell the truth about what I'm feeling, or actually go ahead and lie about how I'm feeling? That happens quite a lot, right? So, so I might not have even reached that state, and that's quite it's easy to see. The key is to give up this. This is not, you're not being told this in order to measure yourself. And you're not being told this in order to judge yourself. All right? So remember that. This is not a judgment. This is just a statement of fact. All right? We won't want to judge ourselves with where we are. What we want to do is understand how we can grow from where we are to where we want to be. Now, my suggestion is all of you have the capacity to grow to what's called an eight sphere condition. And I call that the condition of at one with God. Right? Now, you've all heard that in different terminology, and we'll discuss the different terminologies in a minute. But my suggestion is give up the idea of where you are and just focus on where you're headed. All right? And let yourself see through what you learn in love, oh, I've got to give up that, that's an error in love. Oh, I've got to give up that, that's an error in love. I've got to give up that, that's an error in love. 
And remember that each time you give up something, you're giving it up emotionally. It's an emotion. It's not going to be something you can work your way through with your mind. It's going to have to be something that's a real change inside of yourself, in your heart. Then you can grow. Right. There's a mic just back there, we need. If you keep your hand up, so just Thanks. Hi, EJ. How are you doing? Um, grateful to be here and grateful to meet you. If you're Jesus Christ, then I'm happy with that. <clears throat> what I'm also happy with is um, my interpretation in dimensions to you are totally different. I come from a traditional background. Yep. From the Maori people in New Zealand. Yes. And I follow those processes. Um, but we stay in a thing called suspension of judgment. Yep. Um, and we don't judge. Yep. Religion, or what you're telling me, things like that. Yep. Uh, but it is a curious thing that you talk to me about because. For want of a word, people use the word dimension, but it's never mentioned on the other side. And it's just an understanding of the human uh, human thing, because they have not the word as per se, dimension, or spheres, or that. And it's only necessary for knowledge on the earth. But having said that, um, yeah, I find it quite, um, quite interesting what you're trying to tell me. But um, yeah, I've been to the 15th dimension. It's quite an interesting place. You know, but as I say, I follow, I follow a culture line. It's always been in our, in our ancestral line since the time of Lemuria, Atlantis, yep. down to Jesus Christ and down to where I am now. But if, if there's an easy way to teach souls on the earth, a simplified way to do things, you know, interesting. Yeah, and so naturally, yourself and my, I can feel a lot of your teachings and I can also feel the group of spirits who are surrounding you yep. uh, passing those teachings to you. And while they, their beliefs are that, that are very, still very culturally along the same lines, there are whole groups of uh, Maoris in the past who have actually dropped those teachings and now have different teachings as well. So um, my suggestion is for the groups of spirits that are with you and yourself to maybe just allow yourself for a moment to consider there might be other things that could be learned in this whole process. because. Because often what's happening for the majority of us, particularly if we're mediumistic, which you are, um, you know, when, when I mean when we can talk to other spirit or to talk to other people who have passed, what happens is we start assimilating everything from the point of view of what they know. But we, we often don't understand there's a whole group of things that they do not know. And that's the difficult thing to face in most cases. And so my suggestion is to allow yourself to look at that and just look at the fact that there might be, I know, and I'm talking now to the spirits with you actually, that there might be a whole group of things that, uh, and I've suggested to them that there are, a whole group of things that they are yet to understand about their condition. Now, with regard to the terminology in the spirit world, there are many spirits who use the term spheres or dimensions. And not, not on the path that you, of the spirits that you've been speaking with directly, but there are many others who use that terminology. My suggestion is not to get hooked up in the terminology, but to understand that all progression is it's about love. It's all about this growing in love, and there's two types of love we'll discuss, and it's about the growing in love, really. And the only thing that's going to help this planet is the growing in love. And the only thing that's going to actually help the majority of spirits who have passed, who are still in very poor conditions, is growing in love. And so we want to focus specifically on that. And, uh, and non-judgment is one of those loving things to actually do. But often what we do is we, we feel non-judgment also means not making a choice or a decision. And they are very, very different to each other. God gave you the ability to make choices. The, God also gave you the ability to determine what the absolute truth is. And we'll talk about how God gives you that ability as well. And are there any other questions about this spheres? Um. Hi. Hi, Jesus. How are you? Uh, good. Uh, when you were reincarnated as Jesus 2,000 years ago, you must spell you in. Um, I didn't reincarnate as Jesus 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago was my first incarnation. 
So I never had a previous existence other than 2,000 years ago. And, and I can remember my life since then till now. Um, but I didn't have an incarnation before. I, my first incarnation was 2,000 years ago, and the very next time I incarnated was this existence I'm in right now, here on the planet. And I never had any other incarnations in between that time. Okay. I just want to clarify that to you. We'll all talk about why that was the case as well in the, in the future, but in the future in the, of this discussion. Um, many people believe that I came to the earth 2,000 years ago in a reincarnation. <coughs> and that is not true. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that I clarified that with you. Um, time, I think it's time now for a 10 minute break so everyone can go to the loo and the toilets, remember, are up the back there, and then we'll come back 10 minutes' time. There's always a danger at these things, breaking after an hour, because everyone breaks and then gets talking, and then before we know it, it's a 30-minute break instead of a 10-minute break. <laughs> What I'd like to do now is uh, describe to you a lot of the processes because what, what's going to happen is that we'll answer a lot of your questions that you've got coming up already by answering them by describing the entire process of incarnation and your growth and all those things. And then after I've described all of those things, you'll probably find a lot of your questions uh, resolved. And if any aren't resolved, then we can resolve them one by one. So let's look at the incarnation process. Now remember I'm talking about your first incarnation. Remember I said there's all these little souls of which you were one half of, by the way. Each one of these souls has masculine and feminine qualities. If you could picture them all gathering around, God's creating them. And what happens is two people on earth get together and they want a bit of action, right? <laughs> and as soon as that desire is any in any couple on earth, some unincarnated souls gather around them, waiting for the process of being able to reincarnate, or I'll say incarnate, because remember this is your first incarnation. So I'm not talking about reincarnation, I'm talking about incarnation. What happens first? Let's say uh, they conceive during the sex act. What happens is that one of these little souls splits and they split into a half. So let's say it's the masculine part that did that first. And two little bodies were created and start to grow. And then at some time in the future, another couple get together and want a bit of action. And what happens is the second half of that soul is attracted to that couple and the bodies begin to grow. And when I say the bodies, there are two bodies that are created in the act of conception, not one. The two bodies are a material body, a physical body we'll call it, physical body, and a spirit body. Now right at the moment, for the majority of us, our spirit body looks as bad or as good as we currently look. And for some of us it might be worse than we currently look, and depending on our condition of love, some for some of us it might be better than we currently look, but it, if you looked in, if you passed today, and you looked in a mirror, and yes, there are mirrors in the spirit world, and you looked in the mirror, you would recognise yourself. That makes sense. Now, many of you may feel like you don't want to recognise yourself like this anymore, but that's too bad. That we recognise ourselves generally. Now, so what happened is these two halves of the soul are now incarnated into two physical forms. Now, if the soul itself has a wide variety of masculine and feminine traits, and the part 
or the parts that are dominantly masculine when they split into the two halves attract the male bodies to be created through, through the act of conception and replication of the cell structure. And the part that's a female, when it's incarnate, will actually start causing the body to generate to be a female body. And that's what happens in the process of incarnation. From the moment you are conceived, or you could say from the moment you are incarnated, you are now individualized. You now am, are experiencing things, moment from moment from moment. And so these are little unborn child, children at this stage, sitting inside of mum's womb, and already it's experiencing. And what is it first experiencing? It's experiencing the emotional condition of its parents. So you know all of those unresolved emotions that you have in you? That little child gets bombarded with them the moment it's conceived. Does that make sense? Bombarded with them. And because many of those emotions don't feel good to even ourselves, of course they don't feel very good to the little child either. And so the little child started out in a six-sphere condition or a six-dimensional space condition of love and very, very rapidly gets harmed with a whole group of emotions from its environment. And so usually by the time a child is born, they're usually de already down into a second or third sphere state by the time they're actually born, after being conceived in a six sphere condition. And within a year or two of after being born, the child's normally down even into a lower state than that, into a high first level sphere state generally. And the reason why is because they're getting bombarded with unexpressed emotion that they're then not allowed to express. You see what happens when the child is born and it starts crying and mummy goes, there, there, don't cry, don't cry, and all of a sudden, what's it learning? The emotion coming from the mother is, please don't cry. The child's going, oh, mummy doesn't want me to cry, so I can't cry either. Right? And so there's a whole lot of emotions that are bombarding this little child that it then suppresses because of the desires of its environment, which, of course primarily the parents, but also all of the environment. So you think about if a, if a person of Heidelberg comes to this environment, let's say all of us here don't like to hear any truth. Let's say we're all in that state. And a person who loves truth comes and stands in front of you. How is it going to feel for them? It's going to feel like a wall of, oh, nobody wants to hear the truth, isn't it? Can you see that? You've often done that yourself. When you walk into a room and you feel this certain energy, you call it sometimes, right? Well, it doesn't feel too good here, something's wrong here, is the feeling you often have inside of yourself, if you're sensitive, right? And the child is feeling those things because it's the most at its most sensitive condition. Mary? Hi. Dallin, I just thought, would you be able to tell us, now we understand we have a physical body, a spirit body and a soul, how can we understand what our soul is in differential from those things? Yep. And why, do the, why does our mother stopping us having our emotions affect our soul so much? So let's say our soul is this. Our soul is a container of emotions, passions, Desires, intentions, memories, which are all really experiences, aren't they? And so forth. Now, every single unexpressed emotion the mother or father or the environment feels gets bombarded at this little soul and it enters it. And unless this little soul is allowed to completely experience that emotion, which it will probably do if it's sadness, it's going to do by crying. So it's going to cry and it would seem to cry for no reason, right? And it'll be there crying, 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 because it's feeling the emotion of grief from its environment and, and it has to express it. That's the way a little child is. It has to express those emotions. So it begins to express that emotion. And what happens with the parent? 
the parent starts trying to want the child to shut down that grief because it's actually connecting the parent to her own or his own grief that he doesn't want to feel. And so the parent shuts down the emotion and what happens to the child? The child then gets a barrage of try, causing the child to shut down its own emotion. And so the child then shuts down its own, own emotion. This, you could think of the soul as the container of these things. It's the container of your emotions, your passions, your desires, your longings, your intentions. And if the soul is that, and this is what needs to develop in love, then you can see that any emotional thing that harms that soul is going to harm its developing in love. Now, there are two types of influences on that soul. There's a truth influence, emotions regarding truth, so where it's allowed to be in truth. And when that soul is allowed to be in truth, it leaps for joy. It actually has a positive response to truth. You, when you hear truth, generally will have a positive response to truth. But then what happens is our mind clicks in and all of our doubts start rising and then we have a far less positive experience. But right at the beginning, when we're hearing truth, we usually have a positive experience. We also have errors entering the soul in the same manner that I just described. Our environment suppresses an emotion and so everyone in the environment gets the emotion to the maximum amount and then they, those untruths or errors enter our soul. In the first century, I called those the sins. Does that make sense? Sin in Greek is when you're missing the mark, when you're missing the mark of perfected love. So when you sin, it's just really an error entering your soul. And it's driven often by an error that is already in your soul. And so we actually do things that harm our own soul by acting in disharmony with love. So every time I act in disharmony with love, I am actually creating something in my soul along, along one of these lines that is damaged. And it's emotional and, and, it's, and it's going to affect me emotionally. So if you can think of your soul as the container of emotions and your spirit body and material bodies are just robots that the soul uses to express itself in, different, in the different worlds, then you'll understand what the soul is. But we are actually only one half of the soul. So every person sitting here is actually one half of a soul, not a complete soul. A complete soul has two halves, and eventually those two halves will come together. And that's where the term soul mates arise from. Does that make sense? So... Soulmates are the two halves of the soul splitting are soulmates. There is only one other person in this universe that is your soulmate. One other be person. Now that person could be on earth or they could have died already and gone to the spirit world. Right? But usually soulmates incarnate within 20 to 30 years of each other. In fact, it's very rare to have them beyond that time because the amount of draw there is when a soul, half of the soul incarnates causes the other half of the soul to be attracted to it. And so there's a high desire now in the other half of the soul incarnating as well. And so usually most souls incarnate within five to ten years of each other. And it's rare to get them 15, 20 or, or maybe even 30 years apart. Although... It has been known for that to occur. Now these soul mates aren't somebody you go along and say, oh, that's a nice fella, I think I really like him, he must be my soul mate. Right? It's not like that at all. The soul mate is actually physically the other half of your soul. It's not somebody you can choose. So how do you feel about that? So much for free will choice of the soul, right? You mean, you mean that this person is the other half of my soul and I can't choose someone different? Yes, that's what I'm saying. The truth is, though, that when you develop, and I should, we'll talk about development in a, in a minute, 
the two soul halves automatically feel drawn to each other. It's an automatic process because the characteristics of the entire soul are split between the two halves. That creates a huge bond of attraction between those two halves. And because of that, the majority of people while they live on the earth do meet their soulmate. But the majority of people meet their soulmate and because of their emotional injuries don't recognize their soulmate at the time. And so what finishes up happening historically, and what we want to do is stop this from happening and start a different thing happening, but historically what's been happening is people pass from this world into the spirit world and they progress through the spirit world in different degrees of love and by the time they get to the fifth sphere, many of them now meet their soulmate again and then they start to connect because they've grown in love enough to stop looking at the physical and start looking at the soul-based stuff to actually see that there was an attraction. Right? We'll talk about how that works in a minute. So if you can see the soul as a container full of all of you, you are the container, but not at the physical state and not at the spirit body state, you are actually this other state which has infinite growth available to it. You can grow infinitely in this state. At one time in your progression in the future, your physical body will disappear. And then at another time in your progression in the future, your spirit body may dis disappear. And what will be left is the complete soul. And we'll talk about how that works. Is there any questions about that so far that you'd like to ask? Thanks, Pete. AJ, um, just to get some understanding uh, about the uh, original soul splitting into uh, male and female uh, parts, when you have a female uh, energy actually occupying a physical bo a male body or a male energy occupying a female body, what, what are the causative emotional uh, reasons for that? Well, firstly, um, I want to just make sure we're clear on a few issues about the bodies themselves. Um, every single half of the soul has male and female characteristics inside of itself. But remember I said it's the dominant sexual characteristic of the half that attracts the body. So if the half, this half is dominantly male, then it will attract a, a male dominant body. So in other words, the gender, while they're living on earth, will be male, and the gender of the spirit body will be male. The same applies for the female. So when, if this half is predominantly female, then it will attract a dominantly female form in both bodies. Now, that doesn't mean that all souls split into male-female because many souls have various, in, in their sum total of sexuality, they have a very wide variance between them. So let's, uh, some of you would have known mathematics, the mathematics at school and so forth. You've heard of the uh, distribution graph, have you? You remember that from your school days? Statistics, to statistical analysis. So if you could think of a graph like this, and on this side is the dominant female characteristic of the entire soul, not the two halves, the entire soul. And on this half is the dominant male characteristic of the entire soul, not the two halves. Then what happens is in between a certain range, what will happen is every soul will incarnate male, female. So in between a certain range of female, male characteristics, each soul will split into a male, female form. And 80 to 90 percent of souls split in those forms. Right? But on this side you can see you've got the area where the soul, the whole soul, the combined soul is dominantly female. When that happens, when the soul splits, even though each part of the soul has still some masculine characteristics, they will attract two female bodies. 
So this soul over here will attract a, a female body when it splits. This soul over here will attract a male body when it splits. Both sides of the soul. So you can see there's only really three possible conditions for your soulmate and yourself. Right? And that is, you're a female and your soulmate's a male. You're a female and your soulmate's a female. Or you're a male and your soulmate's a male. They're the only three possible conditions with regard to soul attraction. So that being said, basically there is God created Female homosexuality, male homosexuality, if we're looking at it from a gender perspective of the earth, and also heterosexuality. From God's perspective, there is no bisexuality. Right? Bisexuality occurs because of the confusion of all the emotional injuries that we have about sexuality here on earth. And in fact, I can even think I am homosexual when actually it's due to emotional injuries that I have that have caused me to think that, and I can think I'm heterosexual and it actually be due to emotional injuries. Does that make sense? And um, if we go, wait for the mic. Is it possible with soulmates that instead of being homosexual, could they just be two brothers born together? Um, the soulmate halves always have a sexual connection. And there's a good reason for that, in that God created you eventually to end up in a permanent sexual union. And so all soulmate halves will have a sexual connection. Now, way, way, way back in the original, like when there were very few people on the planet, there were times when those two soul halves were brothers or sisters. But it's very, very rare for that to occur nowadays. What about the situation of uh, perhaps a mother and a son? And um, that's impossible to occur. God's made that impossible to occur. Oh, okay. yeah. If a mother feels that her son is her soulmate, um, in terms of they have a very strong soul connection, most of the time it is due to having very, very similar qualities and desires of the soul that they then misinterpret as that person being my soulmate. And in New Age literature and philosophy, what I'm calling a soulmate, they call a twin flame. Does that make sense? So um, what I call a soulmate in New Age literature, they call a soulmate anyone you're attracted to, really. And that's not what I'm meaning when I talk about soulmate. So a mother can certainly be attracted to her son in a non-sexual way, but attracted in a lot of other ways, but that does not make them soulmates. So you're saying it's actually something impossible? It's impossible to occur. 